Boker Tov. Today in our uh, Parsha series, we're going to look at Parshat Shalach, and we're going to look at what is a rather common question in the Torah, particularly uh, when it comes to the book of Devarim. Even though we're in the book of uh, Bamidbar, when they're in the wilderness, uh, at the final book of the Torah, Devarim, when Moshe is giving his final speech, he's often recounting and summarizing many of the earlier events and laws that happened in the Torah. Now, Moshe is an incredible human being, but he's still a human being. And we know scientifically that our memories lie to us all the time. It's actually quite easy to convince somebody that something happened that didn't, or we remember things uh, very differently than they happened. However, the Torah is a book that is perfect and needs to gel together, A. And B, there's a difference between remembering you know, how fast that roller coaster was, or did my ice cream fall, and like fundamental things like, oh, I remember that my, my mother was the president of the United States of America. Like, there's some things that you can't uh, remember correctly or incorrectly, like, you know, it, it either was or it wasn't. And what we're going to look at today is one of the most important and challenging and ultimately uh, tragic moments for our people in the wilderness and the retelling of it in Dvarim, and we're gonna see there's some very big important differences, and we're gonna try and figure out why. And as I've said in several of these classes before, no one knows exactly why. So where I'm gonna propose different um, uh, attempts at resolving the issue, and ultimately I think they'll have something beautiful to teach us, but as with many challenges, unless God comes down and says, oh, no, 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 this is what I meant for it to say, unless we have that, we kind of have to use our own creativity, or at least now, we're learning from the creativity of the rabbis. So this is the story of the Meraglim, the scouts. People often call it the sin of the spies. We're not going to unpack every detail of the stories, but in short, and we'll actually see the very um, the, the first pasuk in our parasha that starts off that story. But basically, Moshe sends out another number of representatives of the different tribes to go into the land of Canaan to check it out. To, to come back and give a report. And the report is hopefully going to tell the people, we could do this, you're strong, the land is worth it. But instead, the report comes back and says quite the opposite. We can't do this, we are not strong enough, these people are mighty giants. Well, says Yehoshua and Caleb, or Kalev, but, but we could do it anyways, God is on our side. And then the Meraglim, these scouts, instead of being like, all right, I guess you're right, they say, well, it's not worth it anyway. The land is, is not as great as it could be. They keep changing their tactics to get out of it. It disheartens the people. And remember, the original timeline appears to be that God wanted to send the Israelites right into the land of Canaan, pretty much right away after they left Mitzrayim. But between the sin of the golden calf and then this sin and all the other times we messed up, God decided no. I think we need to not just wait for everybody to die out. It wasn't a matter of that, but God needed a, a paradigm change, needed people to think differently about their relationship with God and understanding of God before they could go in and conquer the nation of Canaan and make it Israel. So that's the basic of the story is these scouts who are not formally trained spies. They were basically diplomats, came in, got uh, spooked, and destroy the people's morale. And God said, fine, then you have to wait 40 years before you can get in. So it's both a punishment, and as I've spoken in the past, also kind of an appropriate consequence. The fact that they were so easily terrified shows they weren't ready anyways. So it wasn't God punishing them for punishment's sake. It was an appropriate consequence for a people that were not ready to conquer a land. But now we get into the two very big distinctions in the story, and there's two major ones, and we're going to look at each of them. So Jane, I'll have you take the first um, uh, um, conflict in the text, the disagreement, and it's based off one simple question. Whose idea was it to send scouts into the land of Canaan? So the first verse from this week's parasha, from this main initial telling, go ahead, Jane. Do you want me to start with num number one? Yes, please. Want? Yeah, okay. The Lord spoke to Moshe saying, send men to scout the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the, to the B'nai Israel." Excellent. So just one other, uh, one thing to point out there, oh, I guess two things to point out there, is God said to Moshe, send. Now the Hebrew phrase is shlach lecha, and we've seen another form of that uh, doubling of word, the word shlach meaning send, lecha means to or for you. We also saw this in, where's the other famous uh, name of a part show where we see this kind of format, Jane? Earlier in the Torah with Abraham? Uh, when it, uh, shlach lecha, to, when he's told to, to, to leave uh... 
to leave his his birthplace. Lech lecha. Lech Go lecha, for yourself. Yeah. So the fact that in that case God is cl- God is giving Avram a command, but it's a command that's for his betterment. The assumption here of the rabbis is that this indeed is God saying to Moshe, "Send the spies or send the scouts," but it'll definitely be worth it, and I'm I'm happy about it. Every, everything's going to turn out, you know, fine and dandy is the way that many understand it. However, regardless of what the lacha really means, God is the one who says, "Send them." But then we get to the book of Devarim. And now it's Moshe speaking to the people. And go ahead, Jane, source number two. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead of ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back word on the route we shall follow and the cities we shall come to. I approved of the plan. And, I, and so I selected 12 of your men, one from each tribe. Thank you. Who's missing from this telling of the story? In the beginning, it's God says to Moshe, Go send, uh, go send the scouts. And in the second one, uh, there's Moshe. And who tells Moshe to send the scouts? Uh, B'nai Israel. Yeah, the people. The yeah. people tell him to send it. And then, and then he doesn't even turn to God because there's one attempt. I don't know if I mention it later, but I, I know I read it. One explanation is that Moshe is actually talking about what happened before our Parsha. Because again, the Torah doesn't record every single event of history. So maybe Moshe is telling the full story is that you are clamoring to send a diplomatic mission. And then I turn to God and ask him. And God's response was the beginning of Parshat Shlachacha. That would be fine. That would work. Except here, he just leaves out. He says, I approve. In the Hebrew, it's Vaitav Be'enai. And it was good in my eye, Hadavar, the thing. He doesn't say that God approved it at all. God is not a part of this at all. So why is uh, Moshe putting all of the blame on the people? Um, I mean, I understand why Moshe wouldn't want to blame God, but it doesn't seem to be an accurate telling of the story to leave God out of it. And Isabel, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you for the um, second. So that's the first question is, whose idea was it to send the scouts? Was it God's or was it the people's? And the second uh, distinction is minor, but very, very important. So Isabel, if you'd read source number one here under the blame game, please. The Lord said to Moshe, How long will this people despise me? And how long will I have no faith in me, despite all the signs that I have performed in their midst? I will strike them with plague and disown them, and I will make of you a nation far more numerous than they. Excellent. Thank you. So in this telling, and again, this is this week's parasha, after the sin of the scouts and the people are disheartened, why did God send us here? You know, what's the point? We're not even going to get to conquer Canaan and their anger at God. God's response to Moshe is basically this people, they hate me. They hate me. So I want nothing to do with them. I'm going to get rid of them with a plague. You know, God's automatic thing. Um, you know, like when, you know, when, when, when a couple gets in a fight and, you know, even the smoke, oh, did you, did you, did you do the laundry? That's it. I want to, I, I want to break up with you. I want to go away, you know blowing out out of proportion. And then God says, I want to get rid of the people and start over with you, Moshe. You didn't do anything wrong. I still love you. But then, Isabel, go ahead, source number two, and Dvarim, a slight shift in who God blames, please. Because of you, the Lord was furious with me too. And he said, you shall not enter it either. So this is actually, it's not necessarily a, a change in it, but it's something that wasn't mentioned earlier. So Moshe still says, it's your fault. So that's consistent. But now he says, God was mad at me. And that's the reason I don't get to enter the land. And this you can find whole essays on. Um, And we don't really know why Moshe was not allowed to enter the land of Israel. There's more meta explanations that perhaps the people wouldn't have been successful if they were still relying on Moshe. And there's ones that he, because he lost his temper and hit the rock. And then here it's suggesting uh, Moshe himself is suggesting that he doesn't get to go in because of what happened at the sin of the scouts. Except immediately after the sin of the scouts, Hashem turns to him and says, I still love you and I want to create a nation of you and kill everyone else. So what's going on here? Why is Moshe changing the narrative? Why does in the second version of it, he says it was the people's idea. And in the second version of it, he says that God was just as mad at him. So before we go in, and as I said, there's no real clear answer here. But before we go into the text, I'm curious, Jane and Isabel, if either of you have any thoughts, and you might have more at the end once we've gone through the text, but why do you think Moshe might be changing his telling of the story, A, and blaming the people, 
and B, in claiming that God hated him afterwards when God did not blame uh, Moshe at all for it. And uh, Jane, you're muted, but if you have any ideas, they will come to you later. Excellent. So actually, Jane, I'm going to unmute you anyways, because we'll, we'll be shifting through. So the rabbis take a, a number of attempts to try and gel the two stories together. And the truth is, the rabbinic attempts are actually quite effective. There might be some slight holes in them, but they're beautiful, they work, and they almost always end with a beautiful message. So even though one could look at this, this disagreement, this conflict, and say, boy, this is a real mess, uh, the rabbis were really able to finesse it quite beautifully um, and effectively. Um, excellent. So Jane, if you would take one of the earlier attempts from the Talmud, um, there's also Midrashim, but the Talmud is about contemporary with a lot of the Midrashim. So this one from Babli Sota, please. It is stated in the Torah that God told Moses, send you men. Reish Lakish says, send you means that you should send them at your own discretion and not as a divine command. So here's a very important thing that the Hebrew uh, would help with, which is shlach lecha. If God had just said shlach, send, it would be a clearly a divine mitzvah command. But the fact, you know, here, this is where we get the idea of lecha means, you know, by, by your choice, if you want to, if you don't want to. So ultimately... What's going to happen is up to you, Moshe. So that's the first statement that Reish Lakish says. It's not actually a, a command of God. God gives it as a suggestion, and then Moshe decides whether to do it or not. So go ahead, Jane, then it continues. As if it were a div divine command, does a person choose a bad portion for himself? Since God knew the nature of these spies and that they would ultimately slander the land, he certainly would not have sent them himself. And this is the meaning of that which is written in the passage where Moses retold the story of the spies, and it was good in my eyes. And Reish Lakish says, the implication of these words is that it seemed good in my eyes, but not in the eyes of the omnipresent. Excellent. So one way to resolve this is how one interprets the phrase shlach lecha, which I, mentioned, I did mention earlier. And it's basically that God never told us to send the scouts. Perhaps again, I, I had also mentioned earlier that maybe the people were kind of clamoring, like we're a little nervous, what's Canaan gonna be like? And so Moshe turned to God and God's response was, it's up to you. I'm not gonna say if it's good or not, you make the decision and deal with the consequences. And if that is, and by the way, that's a possible interpretation because shlach lecha is a weird way to give a command. Again, we only see it really other, you know, in lech lecha, which is a unique command that does turn out good for Avraham, although he, well, Avraham wanders around for some time before he makes it um, to the land that God will show him. But here, this weird language implies there's something funny about this command, which leaves open the second telling of the story where Moshe says, really, God had nothing to do with this. God kind of said, mm, it's up to you. So this is on us. So it's also, it seems to me, a recurrence of something that we've talked about in other classes as to whether we have choices in, in following law, you know, commandments and whether we have choices in our own lives and whether God is, or whether there's predestination in everything that we do. Absolutely, and, and there could be a lot of unpacking is here. Well, if God knew how it would turn out anyways, you know, what does that mean for free will? What choice, what does the choice mean? Uh, so it's, it's a very sticky thing there, but here God is saying, I give you, the, the Torah is quite explicit. God says we have free will. So philosophers, it turns out most philosophers don't think we really have free will or not full free will. And that's important to talk about, but God says we have free will. God gives us choices. And at least as Jews, that's what matters to us. So it's actually a pretty good way to resolve it is God is not really, at least for the question of uh, why God um, uh, or who, who actually chose to send them. Why does it say God in our Parsha and not God later is God never really was the one to make that decision. Um, now, oh, and here I did, I did mention the idea that, and Isabel, I'll unmute you for this. Um, so that first one, it makes it sound like it's kind of Moshe's choice, but the second one suggests that the people had a role. So Rashi here, basing himself off of a number of Midrashim, including from the, the Talmud that we saw earlier, suggests something, uh, uh, either an addition or a slight difference. So go ahead, Isabel, uh, from Rashi. Send thee more literally for thyself. That is according to your own judgment. I do not command you, but if you wish to do so, send them. God said this because the Israelites came to Moses and said, we will send men before us, etc., as we will send Deuteronomy 1, 22. 
And you approached me, all of you saying, we will send men, etc. And Moses took counsel with his my Lord, and upon he said to them, I have told them long ago that it, the land, is good as it is seen in Exodus. I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto a land flowing with milk and honey. By their lives, I swear that I will give them now an opportunity to fall into error through the statements of the spies so that they should not come into possession of the land. So tough and we fall so much and so tough. Excellent. Oh, you don't have to read all the, the, the footnotes there, but um, thank you. So this is, again, I had mentioned this earlier, the idea that it wasn't in the text. Midrashically, the people were clamoring to Moshe. And by the way, we have a lot of Midrashim, Midrashim that are wild and just out there and are clearly just meant to teach a lesson or make a point, but would never fit in the text. This Midrash, and in fact, Rashi, even though that doesn't always fit perfectly, Rashi's philosophy is that even if he brings a Midrash, and there's no proof that it happened, and it could even be wild, They'll only bring ones that work well in the text and help explain a hole in the text. And this does a great job. Why did God out of nowhere decide to send, to, to give Moshe the option? Either God should have just commanded him because it was God's idea, but, or, or not, or say, don't do it at all. Why would uh, God give Moshe an optional command? And the answer could be this Midrash, which says the people were saying, we're worried. We don't know if the land is good enough. Now, the end of the source, again, based on these uh, other midrashim, God is not so nice here and saying, look, you know, if you don't trust me that the land is nice, I'm going to let you go see for yourself. And I know how it's going to turn out and there's going to be a punishment for it. Now, again, it's even though here it implies it's punishment for punishment's sake, ultimately, it's more a matter of consequences. And what I mean by that is the people just aren't ready to trust God. They don't believe God that the land is good. So it's not God just saying, well, here's a picture. I'll send you an email with pictures of land. That's not going to cut it. These are people that are so emotionally and spiritually broken from their time in servitude and slavery that they are not ready to be strong and to found a nation. So again, God doesn't want to punish them because he enjoys seeing his children, his people, his humans suffer. God knows that these people are not ready to conquer the land of Israel and the only way to get them ready is to have them wander around and cohere, come together as a nation. And when they do go in with Yehoshua, even though he doesn't finish conquering the whole land, it is incredible the amount that the people are able to accomplish under Yehoshua. So clearly, that is a nation that's not perfect, but a nation that's come a far, you know, come come a, a very um, come a long way. It's come a very long way from where they are at this moment. So now we've seen here some really good ways to potentially explain who actually sent the scouts. And it wasn't God. It was the people clamored for it. And Moshe asked God for permission. And God said, if you want to, knowing the consequences. Now, again, we don't have exact proof for that, except maybe for the phrase, shlach lecha. But the other question, we saw the contradiction, is Moshe says, um, you know, God was, it says God was happy with him at the time. And then later he says, and because of you, God is mad at me and I can't go into the land. And that one is actually not quite as difficult to explain. Um, and the idea could be because, again, Moshe now in the book of Dvarim, Deuteronomy, is kind of looking over, reminiscing on everything. And what he realizes is that events, even though at that moment, the sin of the scouts, God may not have been mad at him. But things kept happening with the people's anger that kept pushing Moshe further and further along till he hit the rock and just lost his temper and realized he couldn't be the leader that these people needed. He couldn't be the calm, collected Yehoshua. So it's not necessarily that Moshe meant because of the sin of the scout specifically, at that moment, God said, you can't go in, but rather because of sins like that. And the fact that we couldn't go into Israel and that we had to wander for 40 years and you kept complaining, you just pushed me over the edge. So ultimately, and, and again, is it really their fault? Yes and no. Moshe has to take and does take responsibility to some extent. But I think what he's saying is because of events like that, ultimately it pushed me too far and I lost the right to go into the land of Israel. Now that's not literally what it says, but that's probably the best explanation for what I've seen for why Moshe says, God was mad at me at the sin of the scouts and said I couldn't go in. That's not actually when it happened, 
but it was things like that that led up to God not letting Moshe in. So we have one more source we're going to see today, which is just a beautiful contemporary one that kind of brings it all together. But are there any questions up until now? Beautiful. So I will go ahead and take this um, this last source. Um, oops. And this source is from a contemporary rabbi. I think he was actually born in the States and went to yeshiva in New York, um, but he has... Uh, both a PhD in Bible studies, and he's a rabbi, and he teaches at several, uh, from, and he studied at Bar Ilan, um, but he also teaches at the Herzog College in Israel, which teaches Bible studies. Um, I think that's the one in um, uh, Har Etzion or Gush Etzion. So he's, you know, a deeply religious, a religious Zionist, and really an incredible scholar, um, who his English is also perfect. So he wrote this beautiful um, Devar Torah, trying to find the, the, the balance between these two sources. And again, earlier parts of his article helped me put this class together. So I want to give credit where credit is due. But his summation in the end um, really captures what Moshe was trying to do in the book of Devarim and why Moshe might have changed his telling of the story and put his emphasis on different things in book of Devarim instead of just giving over a dry, um, cold, uh, point for point retelling. We didn't need that. We already had that. We already had the book of Bamidbar. Why would Moshe just retell the story that the people already knew? Why does he change something? So Rabbi Dr. Yonatan Grossman says, in actuality, the story itself contains both descriptions, meaning what we saw, the things that seem to be a contradiction about Moshe, a God sending, and then the people wanting, about God blaming only the people, about God blaming Moshe. It's all contained in the story that of Shalach and that of Devarim. However, in each place, there's a different emphasis with different details. One time God's approval is mentioned and one time the will of the nation is mentioned. One time the sin of the spies and one time the words of Yehoshua and Caleb. There were other things I didn't include here, but there are other differences in the telling of the story. Um, and again, he's explaining why all, you know, just why does it seem we have two different versions? Why is there a different emphasis in Moshe's speech from that which is emphasized in Parashat Shalach? For this, we must understand the purpose of the historical review that Moshe is conducting on the eve of the new covenant that is to be forged. These are Moshe's last words to the people. Again, he's not just giving a dry history lesson. He's giving them a specific educational, inspirational message, and he needs to finesse things or pick certain parts of the story for a specific reason. In light of the historical description, Moshe wishes that the nation understood the value of the Torah's existence and God's word. And now, O Israel, heed the statutes and the ordinances which I teach you to do them, that you may live and go in and possess the land which God of your fathers, uh, which the God of your fathers gives you. So that's a statement in the book of Dvarim. And Rabbi Grossman, Rabbi Dr. Grossman here is claiming like that's the whole point of Dvarim, is everything that's going to be in the book of Dvarim serves this purpose, to understand God and to appreciate what God has given you. So I'm going to tell you the whole story and everything, but I'm going to put everything in the context of what happens when you disobey God. Why is it so important to listen to God? Since Moshe has an educational purpose for this review of the events of Israel in the desert and the wilderness, it is important for him to emphasize the nation's situation and the spiritual level of the public at these events. The story of the spies in Parashat Shalach, which is this week in Bamidbar, um, focuses on the sin of the spies. Well, Moshe, addressing Am Yisrael, the nation that's about to go in the land of Canaan, focuses on the sin of the nation. So let's just take that in for a moment. Is back in Bamidbar, it may have been that the scouts were the big issue, but that was, it was indicative. It showed us a bigger issue is people were not united. One person over here wanted the golden calf and this person led a, a group there. You had a Korach here. You had, you know, you had a, 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 the scouts here. You had individuals all over just messing up everything and misleading the people. But now that they're about to go into Canaan, they're not individual tribes about to fight and bicker and one person can, can cause a rebellion. They're a nation. And, and Moshe wants to remind them of that. You are not individual people anymore. You are one united nation, which means you have to take responsibility as a nation. Like at the sin of the scouts, instead of saying, oh, they did it, you have to collectively say, we did it. And that is a big shift. And that very much, very much still speaks to us as a Jewish people today. And all peoples are all, our default when everything goes wrong is to look around and say, 
he did it, she did it, they did it, instead of saying we take collective responsibility. Because when you blame others, nothing gets done except blame. However, when you take collective responsibility, you work together, you can move mountains. Um, so I'll conclude and then open up for questions. Um, the 10 spies who issued an evil report on the land are not important now. Like I said, what is important is the refusal of the nation to go up and inherit the land. And that's another point that he points out. It's not just that now they're collectively a nation, it's that after the sin of the spies, people did generally come together and say, we're not ready for Canaan. So Moshe is saying there was a moment in history when you weren't even ready to go and to conquer the land that will be Israel. You need to be ready. All of you need to be ready now. And you can't let one group of these scouts lead you astray. You need to be sure of it in your heart. The main characters in Parashat Shalach are the spies, but Moshe places a harsh spotlight on the behavior of the nation and its reaction to the mission of the spies. Moshe says, it's about all of you now, not about individuals. It is about you as a nation. So Dr. Grossman's, Rabbi Dr. Grossman's explanation is that the story did include all of these elements. And we saw in the earlier sources how you could easily make the story work together, make the sources work together. But that's almost not the point. Moshe, it's not that he doesn't care about the story, it's that he cares about something else much more. And that's giving a very powerful lesson of rebuke to the people because the spies don't need to hear it anymore. They're, they're not all dead, but a lot of them are gone now. But the people, the next generation are the one that need to hear, not let's blame this president or this leader or this one group, but it's on you now. And you have to work together to make the world a better place.